You guys are here to learn about eating real. And so I do this all the time. You guys have heard what I say most of the time too. And so what I'm gonna show you in a sec is actually from um, somebody that created the 100 day real challenge. I don't know if you've heard of it, but pretty much it's 100 days of eating real food. And real food, like Diane was saying, has specific things to it. I will be the first one to tell you that eating real is probably one of the hardest things to do. I'm trying to do it right now and it's incredibly hard. Diane kind of gave you a background about it. What I like to say is actually what she does um, in this 100 day real food challenge. When you read a label, even something like this, I'm just gonna see. Uh, when you read it, what you wanna make sure is that it has five ingredients or less. Out of those five ingredients though, none of them should be refined and all of them should be foods that you actually know the words for. So for example, one of the things people always are, comp uh, they ask about are say potato chips. There's some potato chips out there right now that are three ingredients, potatoes, oil, and salt and salt, that's it. The problem though comes with the oil that they're deep frying it in. The oil that they're deep frying it in is usually so refined that it's horrible for you to be using anyways. And so when you look at ingredients, you need to know what it is that you're eating. If it doesn't sound like something that you know, you probably shouldn't be putting it in your body. And so I am, I try to eat that way, but it's incredibly hard to as well. So the one thing that you did have on your menu today, I'll be the first one to say that isn't that way, is your good old dessert. This dessert is not considered real food. And the one ingredient in there that makes it not real is the sugar. Sugar is not considered a real food because it's processed. When we talk about processed foods in the kitchen, as long as it hits heat, it's considered a process. If you really look at the word process, it means that as soon as you do something with it, it's being processed. And so I'm not asking you to go to, into raw foods because that would be what a real unprocessed food person would be eating. You'd be eating things that are slightly processed, but you're doing the process. So you're the one cooking it. You're the one actually making it taste a certain way and do certain things. And so couscous is a great one. Um, couscous, whole wheat couscous, I usually buy from Trader Joe's. I'm gonna give you guys one thing on the Trader Joe's web, uh, one ingredient from Trader Joe's that you need to stop buying just because, not that it's bad for you, but it's a misconception that we have about what they sell there. Um, there's a couple more that I'll give you, but for the couscous, it's super easy, but I wanted to talk about it. I know you guys can't see yet, but I have um, couscous here and then I've got some cucumber cherry tomatoes, red onion, garlic, mint, and some parsley. Has anybody ever ha had a traditional Lebanon tabbouleh? Yes, thank you. Okay, if you go to Lebanon or a, anywhere in the Middle East and you have a tabbouleh, a tabbouleh is not grains. It's this much grain with this much vegetable. It's not supposed to be heavy on the grain. The reason why we gave you so much grain today is because you don't have much of another base kind of thing. So I up the amount of grain. But if you talk about traditional tabbouleh, it's very interesting. It's mainly all vegetable. It's hardly any grain at all. Second thing about it, they don't actually cook their they don't actually cook the grain. If you've ever tried, if you've ever, you can try this at home. Whole wheat couscous, all it needs is actually liquid. So what you can do is you can actually soak it in lemon juice and it'll absorb it and it'll still give you a kind of bite to it then. And then you don't even need to turn on your stove and mix in all your ingredients after that too. And so I've got couscous that I'm gonna mix in and I'll just, super easy. And this lasts quite a while. So I'm just gonna throw in, and I have these recipes ready for you guys to take home today too. And then for mint, there's a lot of different ways that you can deal with mint. I find just picking them off is the easiest way. Um, if you can find, what we usually use is spearmint, um, but if you can find other mint, go ahead and use it. Use any kind of mint that you have ready to go. Um, again, wholesome choice is where I usually go for it, buying it. And then for those that don't know how to hold a knife, I've gone, works. See if it'll work now. Good to go? No. Okay. Yay. Okay. So for this, 
what you're going to do when you grab your blade, hold your blade. Um, one of the things we like to do is hold the, the actual handle of the knife. Don't hold the handle. The handle's there as a guide. Hold the blade. Put your thumb on this side and then it should be an extension of your arm. And then your other hand, you're going to claw and you're just going to pull everything together and push forward. And that's it. That's all you're going to do. If you guys were here yesterday, Christine Ha from um, Master Chef, The Blind Chef, she was here cooking. We had to watch because none of us believed that she was actually blind. She was blind. She is, she is blind and she can chop just like that. And it's, it is scary to watch her chop and stuff. She was saying that when she does cook and do demos, it is, it's hard for people to sometimes watch her because you're scared for her. But if you, if you hold on to your food and you just grab onto it and tuck your fingers in underneath, you'll realize it's actually really, really easy. Oh, thank you so much. So I'm gonna add my mint in there and then I've got parsley. For parsley, hold on to the stem if you want. And then if your knife is sharp enough, it should be able to cut off the hair. I just call it cutting, trim, giving it a trim. And then you're gonna pull forward and then hold on to your parsley stems. Your parsley stems have more nutrients in them than the actual parsley does. So if you can, add the parsley into the actual salad too. And for parsley, it can sometimes be pretty dirty. So if you want, soak it for a little bit and then just put it in a salad spinner and spin it all together. And then we've got cherry tomatoes, which I love, but when we're talking, I was talking to Mo from Sustainability today. Um, some of the ingredients that we love the most in this world are the most detrimental to our environment, including the tomato, unfortunately. The tomato is one of the one, it's tomatoes, peppers, a lot of things with seeds in them, like fruits. Fruits take a lot more water to grow than a green vegetable does. And so when you eat those actual things, think about it, I love tomatoes to death and I would hate to eliminate tomatoes, but a lot of chefs now that own farm to table restaurants like, um, like where they have their own farm, they cook from their own farm and things like that, they've eliminated cooking any kind of tomato dishes just because it's so depleting to their soil and the other crops around it. The other one, corn and wheat. Those three items, corn, wheat, and tomatoes are very, very, very detrimental to grow in, an, in the environment that we live in. And so we have a lot of, um, I know we're all going through like the drought issues and everything like that. So it's very interesting what it is that we're <laughs> saving water for. Because if you guys didn't know, 80% of the water that we're actually using right now isn't being used by us it's the farmers that are using it. We're only using the 20%. So it's 80% versus 20%. The growers are using 80%. And one of the worst ones in California, the good old almond. And so the almond farmers are not being, they're not playing fair right now. And we're getting blamed for the drought, but they really are taking quite a lot from us. And so we've got that, go, um, tomatoes in there and then red onions too. If red onions are too strong for you, soak them in water. That's all you have to do. Soak them in a little bit of water and that kind of strong flavor will then go away. And then red wine vinegar and um, olive oil. And then you can also use lemon juice if you want. Really up to you. But that's all that goes into this dish. Store it in your refrigerator. And then to make this a meal actually, what you can do is, what I like to do is, and then cucumbers too, Persian cucumbers. What you can do is grab romaine lettuce leaves and just put them in romaine lettuce leaves. Or grab yourself like a whole wheat wrapper and just wrap it inside. There isn't any kind of protein in here, so if you wanted to add like a meat of some kind, feel free, or you can even do eggs. And just add a couple eggs and then you've got a full meal out of this. This will last a long time. It tastes better over time too, I find. So make this your own. This is just the base of it and you can do it whichever way you want and you can add all the other fun ingredients that you want to. So I'm gonna quickly go through this PowerPoint that I have and then we'll go back to demoing the dessert and the stew. Yeah. So what's most interesting about this or the one, the thing that's gonna frustrate you the most doing this kind of challenge to yourself is getting your protein. Wild caught seafood and uh, locally raised meats, sustainable meats, are very expensive. 
I'm uh, on Monday. I've got an event where um, actually, if you guys didn't know, on Monday the, there's a David Eisenberg. He's a professor from Harvard. He's coming out to do a talk on nutrition and um, sustainability and integrative medicine in food. He wants Arctic char. Arctic char is incredibly hard to find because it's one of those sustainable fishes that a lot of people have been buying out. And so I had a call this morning and I had to order it and I have to pick it up at 7 a.m. on Monday just because I needed so much of it. But it's wild caught seafood is expensive to buy because of where it's coming for, from, first of all. And then locally raised meats. You guys will ask me, where do you find it? Your farmer's market. Farmers markets always have locally raised meats and they can be pricey, but they can be cheap too. This is how you make it cheap. You make a deal with a local cattle rancher or you make a deal with anybody locally that you know raises um, whole animals. A half a cow, you can order half cows, you can order full cows and they'll butcher it for you. At the end of the day, it averages out to about 366 a pound. They'll prepackage it for you, they'll separate it for you, and you just have to have a very, very deep freezer. And you just keep it in there. But you'll get about, you'll get a whole bunch of ground meat out of it. You'll also get your tenderloin, so you got your steaks, and then you've got your T-bones. And it's a very interesting way to buy meat. And you it, it, actually, it works very, very well. And so if you feel like you can handle that much beef in a year, um, go ahead and try buying it that way. Just make sure you have a good freezer because the last thing you want to do is buy all that meat and not be able to freeze it correctly because freezer burn is going to kill that meat. A whole bunch of stuff is just going to make that meat go bad. Um, but you can do the same thing with pork. Chicken's a little bit harder to buy that way, but big pieces of meat you can definitely do slowly. All right. These are the things you can't eat. So no deep fried foods, obviously, because we're talking about oils and oils are usually refined. No fast foods, oh, I know we all hate that. Nothing on the box or bottle or package that has five ingredients or less. Uh, no refined sweeteners. So any kind of sugar is considered a refined because it's gone through a process. And no refined grains. And it has to say whole wheat. They're gonna trick you guys. They always trick you guys. And so make sure when you buy things that you, they should always say whole wheat on it. I'm gonna give you a couple of examples of that too. <laughs> so how to avoid it? Read the ingredients, increase your consumption. This is the most interesting one. Buy your bread from a local bakery. If you've ever read the ingredients on the back of your seven grain from wherever, whole, the, that package, it's incredible how much how many ingredients are on there. Sometimes about 20 to 40 ingredients are on the back of it. If you go to your local bakery, there's the French one um, that's next to Trader Joe's, ask them just to see what it is that they're putting in their bread. All bread is or should be flour, yeast, sugar or honey if you wanted to make it that way, and also uh, your water. That's it, and salt maybe. Um, it should not have like the added preservatives that they usually do. So buy your bread from a local bakery and it'll be healthier for you too. And then go for the whole grain option. High fructose corn syrup. Um, there's different ways that they're calling high fructose corn syrup, so be careful. And never order off the kids menu. The kids menu is the worst menu of all. The one thing I will say, yeah. the one thing I'll say about the kids menu is there's one item that I always find, it's okay, because um, of the, the portion size. Like when you order off kids menu, the one benefit is the size and the portion of it. And so if that's what you're going for, th we're talking about avoiding processed foods, but if you're talking about health and like portion size, a kids menu is obviously the way to go, but you just need to be careful because you'll often find things like chicken nuggets on there and french fries and stuff like that. But Wendy's, after 3 o'clock, has the $1.99 kids meal, so you can't go wrong with that sometimes, with apple slices. <laughs> so just in case, uh, visit your local, farmer, local farmer's market. Where's Enrique? He's right here. This is the man that you guys have been hearing me talk about. 
about Sweet Tree Farms. On Saturdays, go over and visit him at Sweet Tree Farms. They're organic. You guys are all organic, right? Certified organic. Certified yeah. organic. They do a lot of cool hybrids, too. Um, what do you have in season right now? Or what are you selling tomorrow? Right now, in season, we have uh, pomegranates. Uh, we have Emerald Beauty plums. We have persimmons. Oh, yeah, persimmons. Uh, Fuji apples. And then everything else is kind of on the border right now. The stone fruits are on the way out, like peaches, nectarines, all that are leaving. Uh, we'll get more varieties of apples and hopefully more uh, blue lots. The thing is, there's way too many blue lots for me to list off. But yeah. our most famous is the Emerald Beauty. It's a very sweet um, plum without any of the tartness that most people expect. So yeah, so go visit him on Saturdays at, U at the UCI one and he'll help you choose stuff. We actually gave some away a few years ago too, or a couple years ago, I think we had some here. And you can eat all the junk food you want as long as you cook it yourself. And that's hard, I understand, but you can have as much as you want. Just call it junk food and you'll believe it's junk food. <laughs> oh. Why you cut out processed food? They're all an illusion, often appearing to be healthy. Omega-3s, you'll see omega-3 labels a lot. You'll see um, uh, added, added things into it, like uh, vitamins and things like that, or it's fortified. All of those things are a process that makes it even worse for you. Coronary heart disease, diabetes, stroke, and cancer. For the top 10 can be traced directly to industrialization of our food. So it's important to remember that. Make smart choices and reduce your health care costs later in life. That's important for you guys to realize. If, yeah, I understand organic beef, organic whatever is going to cost you two to three dollars more per pound. But at the end of the day, that hospital bill that you're going to get because you have coronary heart disease is going to be significantly less than if you had just spent that extra three dollars on your meat. So realize those things. They are more expensive, but make the right choice. And why would you ever eat something that never rots? McDonald's is coming out and saying that it does rot, but um, we've found out that it doesn't. If you guys haven't seen, McDonald's trying to defend themselves right now. They're going through a big ad campaign, going through why they're, how they're not using pink slime for their chicken nuggets, or they're not using, um, none of their food actually lasts that long. Their excuse right now is that it's dehydrated foods, and so that's why it doesn't rot. Just, just for you to know, yeah. And most foods have too much salt, sugar, or oil to everything to make sure that it tastes good to you. So 90% of processed food either contain corn or soy. And so that's important to remember. We don't need that. And because we're one of those few countries that chooses not to label GMOs yet. So we don't know where our corn or soy is actually coming from. So you need to be careful with that. And it comes in different names too. Um, you get a whole bunch of health benefits. Energy, losing weight. A lot of people feel like because they're gluten free now, they get their energy back. It's not that you're gluten free or that um, you've cut out certain things in your, it's, because when you're gluten free, you're not eating processed foods anymore because you cut that out. If you cut out processed foods, you'll get the same effect as going gluten-free. A lot of us don't need to go gluten-free. It's just we need to watch where our gluten is coming from as opposed to just completely eliminating it. Completely eliminating it, yeah, there are a lot of people who swear by it. Um, I, I'm not an advocate or I don't say anything much about gluten-free. I know how to cook gluten-free, but a lot of gluten-free foods you have to be careful too because they're using nuts as substitutes and so they're higher in caloric value and fat. So you have to be careful. Instead of going gluten-free, try just cutting out processed foods <laughs> first because what's happening now is a lot of people are thinking they're gluten-free. So all these companies are coming out with gluten-free options for you, but the problem, they're so processed that they'll make you feel back into that, fall back into that trap kind of of being gluten-free. Alrighty. Um, rather than counting calories, watching fat grams, just healthy eating, that's all. That's all you need to really be careful of. Um, and it just makes sense to be able to pronounce everything on the list. I know we're in academia and we all know certain words and things like that, so um, we think that we know uh, where it's coming from, but you really, really need to know before you eat it where that list of ingredients is from. So, Food myths. 
Healthy diet means low fat, fat free. Obviously we know that's not right. This is the funny one, multi-grain crackers. Multi-grain is a word that, that marketing companies have realized that we're attracted to. Multi-grain means absolutely nothing. It could be three completely processed grains. It's still multi and it's still a grain and therefore it's multi-grain. It's natural, I've talked about this before, this one bothers me the most. Natural is a label that costs absolutely no money. Organic is, costs money. Natural you can slap onto any packaging and not get in trouble for at all. And organic packaged food is better than conventional, it's not because there are organic foods still can be processed. Organic cookies are processed, there's a whole bunch of organic foods that are still processed. High fructose corn syrup is much worse for you than sugar. They're the same, you guys. There's no study that says that high fructose corn syrup is worse. What there is a uh, consensus on is that too much sugar in your diet, whatever form it is, is bad for you. That's the consensus. Bread that's being made in the grocery store or bakery is fresh. It's not. Most cases it is, but it's not always. It could be frozen and delivered. Not that I would say that Dunkin' Donuts is, uh, un is a good food, but if you guys didn't know, Dunkin' Donuts, they don't sell donuts. Their main goal in selling, making money is through their coffee. So guess where the donuts are? The donuts come frozen. Mm -hmm. And when they make it into the store, they kind of defrost them, bake them off, and then glaze them. But they're frozen donuts from Dunkin' Donuts that you're getting. At least, at least Krispy Kreme, they're making them in there, but not that. Margarine and earth balance. I know a lot of us like our earth balance and think it's healthier or margarine, it's not. That was a misconception from the 70s, 80s. Earth balance then came out because of the soy. Um, again, be careful when you use that. That's why we're using coconut today. Some people say it, it, cheese isn't a processed food. It is to a certain degree. It depends on where you're getting your cheese from, so just be careful when you buy cheese, what's inside of it and how it's made and following the latest food trend is the way to go. It is not. Paleo is the big one right now. It's dying off a little bit, I find, paleo, but um, it's a scary diet to follow, paleo, if you don't know what you're doing. And the cereal box says it'll lower my cholesterol, so maybe I should give it a shot. It's not. It's everything else that you're eating that'll lower it. It's not that cereal box, unfortunately, as much as we wish. Okay, so these are three deceiving food products. One of them's the Trader Joe's one. Garden veggie sticks, I love these things. They're so good. This is what's inside of them. Expeller pressed sunflower oil, spinach powder, tomato powder, and beet powders. There is so much going on in that one little stick of food that you could probably just eat those ingredients on their own and you'd be a lot healthier and a lot happier. They have packaged it to make it seem like it is one of those great substitutes or great foods that you should be eating. It's not. It's incredibly processed because of how many vegetables they try to get in there through these powders. And so be careful with those. Yoplait light yogurt. Yoplait tries every year. Um, they try to do a lot. They try all the time. The main thing in these guys, anything light, anything uh, fat-free, um, sour cream's another one. Fat-free sour cream. Yes, we are all like, okay, use the fat-free sour cream. It's fat-free, lowering calories, everything. How did we get the fat out of the cream? That's not normal. Cream is supposed to have fat in it. So just make sure that you realize what it's supposed to be naturally or in a normal situation. We have to add all these ingredients to make it light or fat free. And so aspartame is the number one thing. Um, I understand if you're diabetic that you need it, but um, they, these are the main things that are inside Yoplait light yogurt um, that make it just a little bit dangerous to be eating every day. Activia actually is like that too. If you look at the Activia label, it's not exactly the healthiest thing to be eating. So. Faye is the one that I like, or I've taught you guys how to make homemade yogurt too. Homemade yogurt isn't that hard to make. And our good old Trader Joe's multi-grain crackers. This is the really one ingredient that's really tricky, enriched flour. 
Enriched flour is flour, usually whole, uh, not whole wheat, but white flour. And they add all of these ingredients into it to make it healthier so that on the label, they can add a little bit nutri more nutrients into it for you. So they can say it has a little bit more iron or it's got folic acid inside of it. And it's the only way that they can do it is by for using a flour that's been fortified. And so they add all of these things inside, multi-grain flour blend. And if you look at that, I mean, it's soybean, flax, rice, durum, um, wheat, rye. It's a lot of stuff, but there's still things in there that you probably don't know, towards the end usually. But it's a lot of ingredients going into just a cracker. And crackers aren't hard to make. I'm gonna go back to the dessert though. Yeah. Just cause you guys, I thought this was really interesting. Um, this is a vegan recipe. I have the copies of the recipes and I'll give you guys that in a second, but We're using apples. Feel free to use any type of um, fruit for this. It does not have to be anything specific. And we are using sugar, like I said. But what I find most interesting is this part. I think we might have added it in already. Nope, it's right here. Yeah, no. Oh no, that's the coconut oil. I feel like uh, I feel like what's her name from yesterday? I'm like smelling things, Christine. Okay, so the main thing I thought was interesting is buttermilk and the way we use buttermilk. Hold on. Apple cider vinegar is one of the greatest vinegars ever created. So use your apple cider vinegar. It's just a big bottle, so I'm not bringing it out. But any kind of milk that you have, you can use. You can curdle. I'm not saying curdle as in like when you have regular milk and you're adding. So if you had regular whole milk and you added any kind of citrus to it, you know how it kind of breaks apart and it kind of gets that look to it. That stuff, it's buttermilk. So if you're, if you're okay with using regular milk, then go ahead, you can use it. But if you are on like soy milk, rice milk, don't like buying almond milk anymore just because of the whole almond situation. Rice milk is actually the way to go. Um, if you really think about it, rice, it's white rice that they're usually most of the time. Organic, just look for organic stuff. Soy milk, you need to be careful of just because of the GMOs and everything. If, you're up, if you are big on GMOs, I, I just am. I'm scared of GMOs all the time now. So all you do is you take a little vinegar and you put it in there. And it's not going to do much at first. But you're gonna keep whisking it until you kind of, it's not frothy, but you can kind of feel a resistance to it. You'll see like little, little pieces start floating to the top. It's homemade buttermilk, but a, a very light version of homemade buttermilk. And it'll give you that tartness that you're looking for um, that you usually don't get from something like this. And so you just keep mixing and you can use this as a substitute for buttermilk whenever you need. And then you're just gonna add that in. And then we're gonna add flour, sugar, and our other ingredients. One really interesting thing about flour now that you can buy, you can buy white whole wheat flour. It has not gone through any extra process. Don't, get, uh, don't think that it's a processed food. Whole wheat white flour is actually a white grain. It's a white whole wheat. And so you can use that and you still get white products then if that's what you're big on. So if you wanna use it, you can go ahead and use that too. And then we've got vanilla and then apples. So I'm using apples. Kat was nice enough to saute me some nice apples to add instead. And that's it. And then you're gonna put that on the bottom and then you've got your crumble topping and your crumble topping is the best part of it. But all it is is cinnamon, and then a little bit of flour and then nuts too. So you're just gonna add that all in. And then you're gonna take your, you're gonna take your coconut oil and just kind of grab at it. And then this is what you end up with. So you're just gonna kind of go up and then you can add nuts inside of it too. And then you just pour it into a container and you're ready to go. What you can do though is you can make little individual ones. This is a good breakfast, that's why. You can take your filling or you can bake them off so you can just take individual ones. Because one of the things that I find that I do 
that's really bad is for I don't I have to eat breakfast now, but I still find it very hard to eat breakfast, and so I'm a big one with bars. I know, like every kind of bar there is in the world, I think I've tried, so, but they're really, really, really bad for you. They're just not healthy. Um, they have way too many chemicals inside of them, and they just, they're not really gonna do anything to you, but give you a whole bunch of sugar. The other thing is the added sugar in a lot of stuff we've been noticing is just detrimental to what you guys are doing. It'll just slow you down for the rest of the day. If you eliminate sugars, it's incredible what it makes you, like how it makes you feel. So you can make individual ones like this and then just take your crumble topping and just put it on top. And then bake them off, freeze them, or keep them in the refrigerator, and then every time you want one, pop them in the microwave for about 20 seconds, 10 to 15 to 20 seconds, and then it's warm too. And then in the morning then, you can eat like a little fresh, fresh yogurt either that you make at home or like a faille or something, and then eat it with that, and then you've got a full multi, like uh, level, full breakfast ready to go. There's no eggs in here, there's nothing of that sort. Um, it's very simple and the coconut oil is really what's holding it all together. How many of you are using coconut oil now? A lot of you? Okay, yeah. So coconut oil is great. Just, I, I just need people always to realize it's still a fat, and it's still, it's, it's a scary fat too. It's not, it's one of those fats that we think we know enough about it, but I don't think we really know that much about it yet. The great thing about it though, is that it's very unprocessed. It's just coconut oil. There's not really much going on there. But I've said before, when you visit other countries, specifically in Asia, they advertise that they don't use coconut oil because they find it to be incredibly unhealthy. And they do it the real way. Like they take a coconut and they scrape it and they do it the traditional, but they'll advertise that they don't use coconut oil, that they use things like canola oil instead, or that they use vegetable oil because in their mind, those are healthier oils. And so, the main thing with this real food challenge or challenging yourself to eat real food is to actually just, just notice what it is that you're putting in your body before you actually do. I'm not saying you need to completely eliminate everything out of your diet, but it's important to just realize what it is that you're putting in your body um, and what it is that you're eating. And I, I don't have a demo thing for the African peanut stew, but the, it's super easy. I added the lentils and the garbanzos inside just to give it a little bit of extra body. If you haven't bought um, shard before, you can buy collard greens already chopped, super easy. This I don't consider processed. This is, this is still okay to go. But you can buy a whole like this. And if you don't know how to take care of collards, <laughs> they're actually really easy. I make kale chips all the time. You can make collard chips, you can make spinach chips, you can make anything out of it. It dries off really well. There's a very thick stem. Don't throw it away, you guys. What I do is I'll take, so this is the part that I'm using, and I'll break it apart, and this is what we'll add into the stew then. Just break it up into bite-sized pieces. This has a lot of flavor still, though. If you if you're okay with it, this also has a lot of fiber. Either steam it or blanch it and then cut it into slices and you can add it into any stir fry. Kind of like celery almost, but this will have more nutrients than celery does. And it's not gonna be as, um, it's not gonna be as fibrous, fibrous, whatever, as um, the normal stuff. But this actually has a lot of flavor. It's just like broccoli stalks. Broccoli stalks actually have a lot of flavor and it's almost my favorite part of the actual broccoli. So start eating the, every part of the vegetable. Don't pick and choose, eat everything and you're not wasting food then at that point and it's good to just be healthier because you're getting more into your diet. So any questions about anything?